This is part of uh, trying to look at the big challenges that face communities across the country, but particularly I've become aware of it because it's a lot of the, uh, the communities around where I come from in the South Wales Valleys area. Um, and, you know, having a little bit of celebrity means you get asked, will you come along and support this project and this charity and this event and lend your name to things? And uh, one of the things that started coming up more and more over the last sort of seven or eight years, I suppose, was this idea of people struggling around household debt and particularly around uh, high cost credit and the sort of trouble you can get into with that. So when I started looking at it, I realized that uh, what appears to be uh, potentially a simple problem in that you think it's sort of black and white suddenly becomes much more complicated as is the case with most things. Um, and so I've gone on a, on a journey really the last two years of trying to get my head around something that is incredibly complicated. But I keep coming back to the fact that there is a simple truth at the heart of it, which is that life can be hard and it's made a lot harder by people who want to make as much money out of other people's financial problems um, than, than needs to be. So I've tried to address that. I've looked at the kind of work that's been going on in the area around people who do feel maybe excluded from mainstream credit, access to mainstream credit, um, and uh, seen that there's amazing work been going on for years, um, but it's all been happening quite separately. And so the idea of connecting that up working with people in all the different areas uh, around this issue, so regulators, policy makers, funders, the companies that are trying to provide a better alternative, and see if we can work together, do multiple things at the same time, and really work with the momentum I think is really there. It feels like we're pushing a lot of open doors here um, and, uh, and really try and get a, a bigger win. But initially it was people that you know from your community talking about the, the struggles that they were mm. facing. And not just from you know the community that I come from, but you know everywhere I go, you suddenly start to, I feel like there's a real growing awareness of this anyway. That you know, people, friends, family, um, you know, talking about the, how they're struggling around all kinds of different forms of debt. You know, it's not just high cost credit providers, payday lenders, we hear a lot about that, but you know, overdrafts, unarranged overdrafts, credit cards. Um, it, 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 weekly payment stores, all that kind of stuff. I think people are getting more and more aware of it. And the levels of, of household uh, debt are, are increasing you know, rapidly. We're now at the point where it's beyond the levels they were before the 2008 crash. So this isn't just about the effect on individuals or families or even regional communities. This is a national problem now and we need to really look at it. But it is clear that the impact on the individuals, on families, can be enormous. Yeah. on their mental health, on their physical health, exactly. on their ability to survive. Yeah, and that's why the report that's coming out today from the, the Royal Society for Public Health that I commissioned through the Alliance is such an important step in this debate because you know, we know that it's affecting people's financial well-being, but their mental and physical well-being is not something that has been officially part of talking around these issues, and it really needs to be. So uh, you know, I've seen how people's mental health can be. As soon as you start talking about money, people start talking about stress and about how it's affecting them. It's affecting their sleep patterns. It's affecting their ability to go out and socialize. It's affecting their relationship with their partner, their children. You know, I, the fact that now the Royal Society for Public Health has done a, an official report on this, it gives us something more to work with. So the gentleman we spoke to this morning talks about ending up considering taking his own life mm. because of that pressure. Mm. I mean, when you looked into this, did those sorts of stories surprise you? But the pressure can be that great. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. It shocks me and it, and it outrages me and it saddens me, but it doesn't surprise me because I know how difficult it can be. You know, you look at, uh, at how these things work. If you miss a payment with a lot of these high cost credit providers, there's no give. There's no, you know, it's banging on the door and it's calling and it's threatening you with court and it's adding to the, the money problems, charging you more. You know, it's so easy to see how you can just spiral out of control and how much that has a knock-on effect to all different aspects of your life around housing, around work, employment and family relationships. And the brutal fact of it is that it's very often the most vulnerable who are paying the most for their debt. Exactly, yeah. What can be done about that? Well, one of the recommendations in the report is for the regulators like the FCA and the ASA to, uh, to do more to prevent the targeting of the most vulnerable people and communities for these high cost credit products. And, you know, they're already trying to do that. And we're encouraging that the work they've done so far and want to go further with it. Um, you know, there's also you look at the advertising budgets of these big companies, you know, and they've got like five million pounds to spend on getting adverts out there, you know, after your favorite TV programs or, or getting local uh, football clubs or whatever to, to sponsor them and that kind of stuff. It gets them out and then it buys them a form of legitimacy that I think is, is, is not 
right. And these smaller companies who are trying to do more responsible, fairer uh, lending, they haven't got the, they've got like £10,000 to spend for the year. They, they can't get those adverts out. So we've got to try and support them get more people aware of them and, and, and try and bring people together. Because the more people who can come and support those uh, smaller companies, the more they can bring the price of borrowing down and get a fairer deal to people. I mean, one of the things that I think will surprise people, as you've mentioned, people ask celebrities to put their name or their face to an issue. Mm. This is an incredibly complicated area that yes. you've suggested, but you've done your homework on it in order to to move forward with this issue yeah. and to explain, you know, these are these are some of the ideas that we can come up with to fix it. Mm. But it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because your celebrity gives you power, but you also know that people are cynical about celebrity. Of course, and rightly so. I mean, I'm rightly so. I, I think we should always be suspicious of anyone's agenda. Um, uh, it's not to say that, you know, all celebrities out there who are lending their name to something have uh, nefarious motives for it. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. But uh, I think, you know, you can do uh, a little bit of concern can almost be more damaging than, than, than none at times, you know, and that, I certainly realised that in my case, that if I wanted to do something about this, there needed to be a bigger commitment. I really had to, you know, roll my sleeves out and put my money where my mouth is. So, you know, I've, I've funded the Alliance so far. I'm putting, you know, my money into it. Uh, I'm trying to get other people to, to, to have the confidence. Can you tell us how much? Enough. <laughs> I have to keep acting in order to pay for it. That's the point, is that, you know, um, part of what I bring to this is a, a certain kind of freedom and independence. You know, I'm not looking for anyone's votes. I'm not getting paid for this. I don't represent any, you know, vested interest financially in this, in this business. Um, and I don't have to uh, toe any sort of party line or keep within any organizational remit. So I think that inspires confidence in people within the alliance, certainly, that they feel like, well, you know, in the past, maybe politicians have been a little wary about, about getting too involved with something where it, it, it already still looks like it's still too high a cost, you know, that's going on even with the alternatives. And, you know, and there's push from, from, from people at certain times and then maybe that ebbs away as the electoral cycles, you know, come in and out. Um, so, and other funders maybe lack a bit of confidence if, if, if no one else is putting money in, you know. So I've found that I've been able to, to, to bring people together a bit on this. I've, I've had a very steep learning curve in learning about the complexities of it. And I think people respond to that when they see that it's not just something that I'm, is a side project. You know, this is something that I'm getting into the real nitty gritty of. And then at one stage you did look at buying back some of the bad debt. I mean, how would that work? Yeah, very early on there was uh, John Oliver, the, the British uh, journalist comedian in America, um, did a thing on TV over there where he bought up on the secondary debt market. So essentially, these companies uh, who uh, have defaults on, on payments and, and, uh, and looking at maybe writing off the, 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 the outstanding payments, they can sell their debt to the secondary debt market and then people can buy it at a much, much reduced price, uh, maybe debt collection agencies, and they think that they can still make money out of it. So John Oliver decided to buy up some of that debt at a much you know, lower rate and then just wipe it out. And I thought, well, I, I'd never even heard of that. And I thought, that's, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if that's something I could do. And, and by it's looking into it, it is, yeah. yeah. Well, you wouldn't believe how much lower the, the, the price is for a start. I mean, you're talking about millions being reduced to thousands, you know, in terms of buying it on the secondary debt market at times. So, you know, I thought, well, this is A, something that I could do and it could make a real difference to, you know, to people. Um, and it's also something that stimulates potentially a good conversation about this. You know, it's a hook. You've asked about it. A lot of other people have asked about it. But by looking at it specifically in Britain, the rules are slightly different. Um, and it, it, like I said, it looked like it was a sort of black and white thing. And then you realize by looking into it how complicated it becomes and how overlapping different areas within this are. And I realized, if you, you know, it's no good wiping out someone's debt if they have no other alternatives than to get back into debt again immediately. So you start going, right, okay, well then there needs to be alternatives, there needs to be greater awareness, financial education, there needs to be more joined up thinking about this. And that's essentially what led to the, the forming of the Alliance. I mean, when you, when you speak about what you think needs to be done and what ought to be done and what you've looked into, I mean, this sounds like the work of a government department. Do you think it is poor that you, uh, with the, within this Alliance, are, are, the, are the people doing it as opposed to there is a there is a bigger conversation to be had, I suppose, about the effects of the state rolling up the drawbridge a little bit and other people having to take the pressure. Not, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about communities themselves, local councils, you know, the, the voluntary sector. There is a whole conversation to be had about that. 
that's not the conversation I want to have right now. Uh, the thing I'm focusing on is being pragmatic about this, regardless of the greater kind of philosophical, ideological arguments around all this. The point is there is a problem and it needs to be solved. And it feels like we're moving in the right direction. It feels like there are a lot of open doors around this. So let's work together and make tomorrow a better deal than today for people. And very briefly, your, 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 the simple message that you hope people will take home from this. There's an unfairness going on and it doesn't have to be like that. There is an alternative. Have a look at it. And finally, uh, there was talk of you giving up acting altogether to pursue activism, if you like, campaigning, although you say this isn't a campaign. Uh, you're not quite giving up acting altogether, you've sort of hinted. Well, it would be, to do it to it would be, yeah, it turns out it would be self-sabotaging. If I gave up the acting, you wouldn't be talking to me anymore, <laughs> you know, so, uh, and I wouldn't be able to pay for it. So I, the, 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 the sort of leverage that I have depends on me keeping a certain profile and having my own you know, financial means to be able to, to, to pay for stuff. So uh, it turns out that I do have to do that, but there's no substitute for a commitment of time and long-term commitment and focus and energy. So I'm trying to find the balance between the two really, and we'll see how it goes. You'd like to be in this for the long run. This is it. <laughs>